a historical romantic fiction set in India, which talks of two stories, but they are not from the same time period. One story is of the 1920s, while the other is of 1970s. That is what Heat and Dust is all about. And that is what we will discuss in today's capsule summary. Hello, this is Hina from Team Tess. Welcome. And who has written Heat and Dust? Do you know? Of course you do. It is by Ruth Pravar Jhabwala. Look at Ruth on the screen. Well, Ruth is a German writer who lived from 1927 to 2013. She married an Indian architect, a Parsi, called Cyrus Jhabwala in 1951, and subsequently she moved to New Delhi. But later she lived in the United States, okay? Now, Heat and Dust was published in the year 1958, for which Ruth received Booker Prize in the year 1975. And an important thing to note here is Merchant Ivory Productions. It was a production house which made films. So out of 44 films of Merchant Ivory Productions, 23 were scripted by Ruth. One of those was also Heat and Dust. So now you know Heat and Dust has been a movie as well as a novel. First a novel and then a movie. Okay, let's start. Heat and Dust illustrates two parallel stories, but in different timelines, 1920s and 1970s. When you will read the novel, these stories will go together simultaneously. But as I have told you, I will try to make the summaries as easy as possible to help you in your exams. So here what I have done is, first I will talk about the first story that is of the 1920s. And when I finish it, I will start with the second one of the 1970s. Does it make sense? Of course it does. So now let's start with the first story of 1920s India. What happens? Olivia is married to Douglas, an English civil servant. In the 1920s, the couple moves from England to Satipur, India for work under the British Raj. After arriving in India, Olivia feels restricted by the strict British society that is maintained in these colonies like India. She does not speak Hindi or Urdu, unlike the Crawfords and the Minis, who get along well with Indians and all the other situations. Did you understand a little bit? The protagonist you must be knowing is Olivia. Olivia is married to an English civil servant, Douglas, and they move to India. But Olivia is not very fond of India, okay? She arrives here. She does not know the language. Although the other core people, the other core friends, Crawfords and Minis, they understand Hindi and Urdu. They, in fact, speak it also, which makes it easy for them to stay in India. Okay. But now what happens? The Nawab of the region sends a dinner invite to Douglas and Olivia. And this excites Olivia to an extent because she has nothing to do but sit home all the day. During this dinner, she meets Harry, a, co a very close friend of the Nawab. And in no time, the two become friends. Who become friends? Olivia and Harry. They bond over their common dislike of the British officials. Moreover, Olivia gets fascinated by the pomp and splendor of the grand palace and is attracted to the Nawab himself who also seems interested in her. Samaj gay. The romantic spark extra marital wale chalu ho gaye hain idhar. I really don't like it when I talk of extra marital affairs, but somehow I feel the novelists, they are obsessed with this theme, maybe to scandalize or maybe to bring that, you know, mirchi in the novels. But personally, let me tell you that once we are in one relationship, we should either end it completely if we're not happy and if we are in it, we should be in it wholeheartedly, right? Why am I giving gyan here? <laughs> Let's read the novel. What does it say? Olivia gets fascinated by the Nawab, okay, who has invited Olivia and her husband Douglas for dinner. Through Mrs. Crawford, she comes to know that the Nawab is already married to a mentally ill woman named Sandy. Shortly afterwards, the Nawab invites Olivia for a picnic near a local fertility shrine called Baba Firdos. She goes and during their visit, 
their love affair begins. So now Olivia and the Nawab, they are in a love affair. Olivia is torn between her husband Douglas and the Nawab. The British officials anyway are quite critical of the Nawab's attitude as they suspect that he is involved in spreading communal violence. Olivia continues to see him in secret, aided by their friend Harry, who drives Olivia to the Nawab's palace and Nawab to Olivia's house. So here Harry is the one helping them to continue with their affair. Now what should happen? Tell me. Soon Olivia finds out that she is pregnant with the Nawab's child. Hearing this, both the Nawab and the Douglas are happy, assuming that the child is theirs. Let me tell you, Douglas has no idea of Olivia's affair, okay? So both of them think, oh, my baby, my baby, they are happy. But then there is no reason to be happy because Olivia does not want to keep this child. Begum, who is the mother of the Nawab, arranges an abortion for her. But you know it rumors, in fact, truth, anything in that small society, you cannot hide it, right? So this news of Olivia's induced abortion spreads like wildfire. Following this, Olivia does not return to her husband, Douglas. Rather, she elopes with the Nawab, never to be seen again in Satipur. The Nawab provides for Olivia, but eventually leaves her, leaves her, for whom? to spend time with Harry in London. Now, what happens to Olivia? She locates herself in a village called X on the foothills of the Himalayas. She lives there until her death in the 1950s. And with this, we are done with the first story of heat and dust. Now I'll, I will take you to the second story, which runs parallelly, but here I have taken it as separate, okay? Second story talks of 1970s. The unnamed narrator, we do not know her name, although in the movie she is given the name Anne, okay? Here we'll call her the narrator. So the narrator receives letters by Harry, a family friend called Harry. These letters are written back in the 1920s between Olivia and her sister Marcia. Now, how is the narrator connected to Olivia? Olivia is her step-grandmother which means Douglas is the narrator's grandfather. So Douglas ki jo pehli wife hai Olivia, she is the step-grandmother of the narrator. Or jo dusri wife hai, kaun? Tessie. Tessie is the narrator's grandmother. Easy? So I've written it here. Olivia was her grandfather, Douglas's first wife, before he married Tessie, the narrator's grandmother. Now, these letters reveal that Olivia moved to India with Douglas, but eloped with the Nawab, the local prince, enamored by Olivia's story. You know, she wants to know more. The narrator decides to travel to India to dig into or to trace Olivia's past. Yes? The narrator arrives in Bombay, finding India much changed from the descriptions in Olivia's letters. And note, here... Ruth, our author, she has shown the poverty and the backwardness of India, for which she has been criticized, okay? The narrator heads to Satipur, where Olivia had lived. She rents a room from a government official there, whose name is Inderlal, an important character, remember? Inderlal, jiske rented room mein kon reh rahi hai? The narrator. And Inderlal lives with his wife Ritu and his mother. Later, the narrator visits Olivia's old house, which has been now converted into a dilapidated government building. Okay, she's trying to know Olivia's past, but abhi kuch pata nahi chal pa raha hai. Inderlal offers to show her the Nawab's palace at Khatam, the once grand but now decaying palace, fails to impress the narrator, and she learns nothing about Olivia's fate. So she plans to extend her state, uh, her stay at India, in India. She develops a daily routine, dresses in saris, and learns enough Hindi to converse with the locals there. She develops a very, very nice friendship with Inderlal and finds out more about this man. His marriage with, with Ritu was arranged by the mother, and Ritu is a simple village girl. The narrator also becomes acquainted with a man called Chid, who claims to be on a spiritual journey sent by his guru. With nowhere to stay, Chid begins to live with the narrator. 
while the people of Satipur see him as a holy man, the narrator feels otherwise. She finds Chid worldly and obsessed with sex. And now a turning point in the novel, she agrees to sleep with him. The narrator agrees to sleep with Chid when he asks, but nothing comes out of it. The narrator forms a special bond with Inderlal's mother, with whom she visits the holy shrine of Baba Firdaus on the annual fertility festival of husband's wedding day. Do you remember something when I say Baba Firdaus shrine? Remember, near here, Olivia and the Nawab went for a picnic? Yes? Meanwhile, the narrator feels that Ritu has some mental illness. How? She shouts in her sleep and she acts very strangely. For her treatment, what does the family do? The family exercises her, which means tries to remove the evil spirit from her body by poking her with hot iron. And the narrator is against this. She's aghast. The next time the narrator visits Baba Firdos with Inder Lal and surprisingly or coincidentally, the two begin a love affair there, just like Olivia and the Nawab. Maji, the leader of the matronly widow in the village, tells the narrator that she is pregnant already before the narrator could even sense it herself. Can you see the parallel things happening? Olivia got pregnant and now the narrator gets pregnant extramarital affairs, everything happening near the holy shrine. How does heat and dust end? How does this novel end? Maji offers to perform an abortion to save the narrator from the shame. However, she refuses. She wants this baby out of bed wedlock. Rather, she chooses to go up into the mountains, just like Olivia, to a town she calls X, where Olivia had gone, she decides to live in ashram and deliver her child while trying to unfold the truth about Olivia, her step-grandmother. And here is where the heat and dust end. I hope you liked it. I hope it helped you. It will, I'm telling you. Go through our capsule summaries. They are awesome to help you even in your college, university, or any of the competitive exams. This is Hina from Team Test. Thank you so much for being with us. Bye-bye.